This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist Matt Collishaw. Collishaw is an artist who creates installations that leverage the ephemeral nature of illusions to explore issues related to perception, moral ambiguity, and the brevity of life. Among his latest work is a collaboration with NFT veterans Daniel Kreberuchko and the team at OG.art. The project extends a floral theme Kalashaw has explored for years by allowing collectors to breed and hybridize new variations based on community interactions and assets in the collector's wallets. And now, conversation about the transformation of ideas into forms with artist Matt Collishaw. Matt Collishaw, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Artsense Podcast. Matt, a lot of times with artists, I like to start with throwing out the hypothetical that if you were sitting down at a dinner party who had no idea who Matt Collishaw is, uh, and they were to ask you, what do you do? And you say you're an artist and they, they kind of probe as to what that means in your case. How do you start to explain to them what your work is and how it is different than other people's? Craig, it's a nightmare scenario. <laughs> Often you get in the back of a taxi and they'll say, so what is it you do? And it's like, ah. You don't want to go there. You don't want to say I'm an artist because then there's an avalanche of other questions. What kind of artist? What you do? Um, I kind of do quite a lot of things, so it's difficult to sum it up. But in that scenario, what I'd say was that generally I have an idea, something that I'm interested in. And generally, it's not just one idea. There's something that's caught my eye, but then there's something else that I've heard a few weeks before, something else that I've read, and I think, okay, so maybe I can draw those threads together and make something that combines all of those different uh, thoughts, ideas, snatches of conversation that, that I've uh, got bouncing around in my head. So it could be like a bit of history, something I've read about technology, something that uh, appealed to me in, in the art world, some you know art historical piece. And then I try to make a form for it. I try to find the form, find the method of bringing this idea out into the world. And it's pretty much the same thing as having a palette with like all the spectrum of colors on there. Are you going to be more melancholy and go with the blues today? Or is it more of a bright yellow and orange type thing? Whether it's oil painting or VR or animatronics, certain formats predispose the audience to interpreting the work in different ways. So I try to find something that dovetails with this idea that I'm trying to put across. But this is the reason I work with so many different mediums. It's all part there as, uh, as you know, it's, it's the artist's palette. Just to start to have that conversation with someone who thinks of, well, are you a painter or do you draw? It's all of the above for Matt Kalashaw, yeah. right? I mean, it's... Well, I, I was always more of a drawer than I was a painter, really. So just getting an idea down rather than trying to finesse it. You know, it's more about the ideas. And to embellish that a little bit, generally the ideas seem to cohere around the human condition, you know, what we all experience mm -hmm. as we go through life and how we perceive the world and how that perception is manipulated and distorted by various agents, whether it's religion, political propaganda, advertising. There's a lot of means to uh, create a distorted lens which changes our view of the world. And I think a lot of the time we, we accept these things and we believe them and they inform the way that we navigate this world that we live in. So that interests me. I mean, I'm an artist, so why wouldn't it be? But it's not only like limited to to what, you know, the paintings in the Sistine Chapel or Russian Soviet propaganda in the 1940s. It could be 
something like a flower. A flower has its own form of manipulation. It, it has a, a particular scent and an appearance, so it can attract an insect to propagate itself. So again, it's a form of manipulation. It kind of interests me that, how vulnerable we are to this psychological hijacking. You know, it reminds me of conversations I've heard you have about your childhood being raised Christadelphian and and um, how you were kind of cloistered away from basically all forms of media and were, were left with reading whatever you could find in the library, but also, you know, a couple hours of reading of the Bible every day. And I'm just, it just makes me wonder, you know, how that influenced your worldview and how that still influences your worldview. Because, I mean, in a lot of ways, you are still kind of picking away at what things are, are we over, uh, overlooking or what, what are the underlying issues that you know, maybe we don't pay attention to because we're, we're kind of stuck in this false reality, right? Yeah. I mean, my dad read the Daily Telegraph. We had books and the radio was on occasionally, but we didn't have TV, which is the thing that kids want, you know, that is the, <laughs> the, the forum where everything is delivered to a, to a kid, certainly during that period. But I think that any experience that you can get growing up that's not malign is going to be useful and helpful, particularly if it sets you out from other kids because it gives you, you're immediately got a different perception of things, slightly shifted. So whereas people in England would have been watching like programs like Tiz Was, these kind of slapstick programs, a uh, guy called Chris Tarrant, very popular TV character over here, very entertaining if you're seven, eight, nine years old. We were reading about Nebuchadnezzar during this period, you know, quite a different <laughs> framing device for your experience of the world. And at the time, obviously, I wanted a TV badly. But looking back, I think it's very valuable to have that experience. And I think my uh, my the debt that I think we have to history, or at least to respect it and acknowledge it, possibly comes from that you know we the emphasis was that everything happened like a few thousand years ago and we're now the situation is playing out until end of days until the, the second coming so being steeped in a book like the bible was it was a great starting point partially because it gave me a slightly different perspective but also because everything i mean the we live in what has been a, a christian country and that has informed a lot of the behavior and a lot of the decisions that have been made in the history, the evolution of this country. So to understand the book that this all comes from and to, to have lived that book for many years, I think has got to be helpful. And there is also obviously a very strong ethical dimension to the Old and New Testament, slightly different in the New than it is in the Old. But I think that's something that I inherited in my work, you know, okay, so you have a choice to do good or to do bad. And there is that difference. And I'm not sure that people grow up watching like uh, popular TV channels were presented with that dilemma quite as starkly. So again, that's something that I'm grateful for. And I think informs the decisions I make when I'm thinking about ideas for the work. Um, and I think finally that this, uh, idea of transcendence, which I try to introduce in artworks. You know, I try to make something when people see it, and it, it goes beyond the physical, it goes beyond the mundane, although there may be humdrum mundanities in it, that there's some urgent need of uh, that I have to transcend this physical world. And I think that must come from being in a room with 100 people, saying prayers, doing reading, this act, this, this reverential, uh, disposition and the singing of hymns and this joyous celebration uh, and this appeal to something beyond the realm that we live in. I think that probably more than anything is something that I've subconsciously absorbed and, and taken on in my work, this desire to transcend. So again, your your work is um, it's very thoughtful they're not one-liners, you know. They're, you're you're asking people to really consider some some pretty weighty issues. Um, 
things like moral ambiguity, uh, you know, death and decay, you know, in a lot of ways calls back to uh, the era of uh, Memento Mori, right? Um, yeah. So can can you kind of talk about how, how that kind of has manifested itself in some of your bigger installations? Okay, the bigger installations. Okay, well, like, uh, well, I mean, big is is making a a thirty foot bicycle wheel at the top of the V and A, right? <laughs> ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, was quite, that was quite a challenge. Yeah, um, a very cold couple of days when we're installing that, like six inches of snow. Uh, one that fits into this subject that we're talking about, which might be interesting to bring up, is the last meal on death row. Hmm. artwork i'm not sure if you're familiar with these yeah, so last these supper right yeah so i mean can i talk about those as, absolutely as an so these are last meals requested by inmates on death row as their last meal the day before they're executed and i restaged them as in the style of like dutch 17th century still life vanitas paintings obviously um it, it's it's a chilling proposition to say, you know, okay, we're gonna we're gonna kill you tomorrow, but you know, anything you want to eat tonight. And there's something about the, the contrast between this civilized attempt to create a veneer before this execution happens. So we'll do this, but we'll do it in this very civilized way. It's just something that's sort of extremely sinister about that. And so I decided to take these pictures to restage them by finding out what everybody had eaten and then restaging them. And so you're looking at something like a cheeseburger or a, a chicken wings, chicken nuggets, pizzas, Coca-Cola, ice cream, all of these kind of fast food type pulp food. But by putting them in the style of the 17th century Dutch still life, you're immediately seeing them in through that lens of the memento Murray, that this is like, a tradition of painting that reflected on uh, us thinking about mortality and the meaningless accumulation of worldly goods, the temperate, the, you know, the, the brevity of life, all of these things. Are you looking at a pizza or a cheeseburger? Mm -hmm. So all of the recreations, which I framed in these kind of very dark, somber, heavy frames, they're very dark pictures, they, they all become like the surrogate portraits of the prisoner that, that had chosen that particular meal and was going to be executed the next day so it was a way of, of using a, a form which was the, the vanitas form to reframe something that was essentially a kind of a, a, a fast food dinner to make people see the same thing that they're used to looking at but in a slightly different way and to, to think about this this supposedly civilized act which was going on which was giving somebody a choice of what to eat before they were executed that's one example. You know, I think another uh, common theme that we see kind of running through your work is is the use of uh, of optical toys, like Victorian optical toys, like zoetropes, uh, Pepper's Ghost, you know, the use of mirrors. Do you see that as a way to get the viewer to slow down and think more about the piece. I mean, it's a conversation I've had with multiple artists uh, in terms of what mechanism they can employ to try mm. to get someone to stop and slow down. Yeah. Is that is that yeah. part of the motivation there? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think absolutely. I think part of it is the fact that I did grow up without a TV and I fetishized what this thing was. And it was considered like iniquitous really to be indulging in this television set. So there was an aura around this thing, which perhaps it shouldn't have. So suddenly this little box in the corner of people's room was dangerous. It could inflict some kind of psychological damage to a kid. And the, the allure through that kind of discipline was very intoxicating. And so, as a kid, I was constantly making little theatre sets out of cereal boxes, etc., trying to recreate a 3D or an animated image, doing little stop motion films, lots of different stuff, little, lots of little optical tricks to convince me or anybody else that they were looking at something that was animated, that was bringing the world back to life in a um, 
uh, in, in another form. So for me, that was the initial motivation, I think. But yeah, I think you're, you're right that you need people to look at stuff when they're in the gallery. And when you've got a digital screen on the wall, you can see what you can see the content on the screen, but what's actually generating the content is invisible. There's all these little invisible electrons flying around, but you don't see how that is generated. So if you use something like a three-dimensional zoetrope or a pepper's ghost, particularly in the way I try to present them, you can see the means of manufacturing that image. If you stay long enough, you can work out how that image is being generated and presented to you. So you can kind of de deconstruct it while you're standing in front of it. I mean, they're also quite compelling things to look at. A good three-dimensional zoetrope is really like, what is going on here? It, it defies reason, right. as does that purpose goes. So ideally, it would stop people to try and work out what they're engaging with. And I think that's good with any artwork if you... Like if you've got a painting on the wall, so what am I looking at? I haven't seen that done before. Is it upside down? What's going on here? And like try to work that out. And then once you engage the person and try to work out what it is, you kind of got them. They're hooked. They're in there. And then there can be something else beneath that. It's also true that any art form, I think, is a form of illusion. You know, you're creating, if you're creating a painting, it's some colored mud, which you daub on a, a canvas or a board, and then you tell people to believe that there's something other than that, certainly a figurative painting. You, you're getting people to buy into whatever medium you've uh, you've cooked up to serve up to the, to the viewer. And I think the, the optical illusions that I use are like an exaggerated, version of that it's like yeah i'm trying to, i'm selling you a dream here i'm selling you something that's not real but the method of delivering it is so effective that you are engaged with it so what does that tell us about ourselves that we are quite vulnerable to being manipulated and being beguiled by by certain methods of presentation yeah i mean it was it was interesting i heard you talking about a a show you had a few years back called thresholds uh where it was a you know, VR space of 3D objects in a room, but it, it, it harkened back to this Victorian exhibition, the first exhibition of photography. And I remember one of the things that you mentioned there was in that Victorian period, they were struggling with the line between science and illusion. And it, it reminds me that, you know, I feel like we're we're kind of getting to that place again with you know, deep fakes and artificial intelligence and choosing to see things through our devices instead of, you know, what's in front of us can open us up to, you know, a lot of questions about reality, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The project that's coming up right now is heterosis, right? Yeah. That's a project that you're uh, releasing through uh, OG art uh, collaboration with uh, Daniil Kravaruchko. Um, yeah. Can you can you talk a little bit about that project? And in a lot of ways, I, I feel like it kind of harkens back to um, a piece that you did or an installation that you did a number of years back called called Sorted Earth. And you know, can mm. you kind of can you kind of tell us how? you know, kind of the genesis for the project and, and uh, in your mind where, you know, what it's representing and where it's going. Yeah. Um, I've, I've made works with flowers for like many years and I originally started doing it just because they were considered a little, little bit of a taboo. They were something for like placemats on a dining table or curtains or greeting cards and the art world didn't really go near them because they were like, considered, I think, too cheesy. But of course, you know, a flower is this incredible mechanism. It's essentially a breeding machine. All it wants to do is to propagate, and it uses all kinds of um, manipulative devices to attract insects or birds to propagate its species and um, further its gene line. So that contrast between being these exquisite looking organisms and the fact that they are survival machines was like a something that I thought I could use. And generally I tried to use them as like a vehicle for an idea. So back in the mid nineties, when I first got a computer and Photoshop, I started putting animal skins onto flowers. 
like a tiger skin, leopard skin. Something that like some kind of weird genetic engineering had gone on. And then I started putting various diseases on the, the, the skins of these flowers. A lot of them were like sexual diseases, syphilis and gonorrhea. Um, that came about through reading a lot of French writers, a guy called J.K. Heisman uh, and Baudelaire, Fleur de Mal, an obvious link, and also some Jean Genet. I wouldn't go into all of that, but it was the, the idea, it was kind of a, a decadent idea of something that's become so opulent that it's starting, that there's some kind of mental decay happening. Uh, and I, then I, I made those as, first of all, images generated with Photoshop, and then I made real physical sculptures, and then I made this huge video installation with animations of these flowers growing with these diseases on them. And the idea being in that we've kind of, Maybe we poisoned one of the ideas. I would we poison the earth, and this is a manifestation of this wrongdoing done to the environment. Um, and moving forwards, I kept my eye on the whole like NFT, like metaverse developments, and I thought, you know, because I work in so many different mediums, maybe it's something I should think about, and it would be a solution for the digital work I'm creating, which generally is exhibited on a screen it's you know it's like back into the physical world again maybe it can exist totally out there in the ether but i thought if i if i wanted to engage with these new mediums i have to do something that actually utilizes the new formats that they're giving us and i think a lot of projects nfts and etc they're skeuomorphic i think they you know it could be an artwork on a wall in a gallery but it's a digital artwork that's become an nft and it's like well what is it doing any different other than being guaranteed on blockchain, the ownership being guaranteed on blockchain? So I started reading more about like generative and dynamic NFTs. And I was also working with Antoine Cardin, this French guy who's got a company called El Gabal in Paris. And I was working with him on developing some social, interactive, immersive, persistent environments where you could, we build the environment in Unreal Engine, people that go in, meet other people, interact with whatever we build, interact with certain pre-recorded avatars, et cetera. So I was thinking about how to do something with dynamic NFG, NFTs, you know, right. the NFTs that evolve with this like, like a social interactive um, aspect to the project. And at that point, I started talking to Nadia from Snarkart, who got the OG platform, mm -hmm. and they were releasing a big project with Daniel and with Michael Jew, who is an old friend of mine. So and it was a kind of really interesting one. Right. Doing. And I've been developing this idea for flowers because I've worked with them for so long. And I thought, okay, well, what's happened with a flower with their genes is not that different to its coding, basically. And maybe we can make computer code reflect flower. The, the genes in a flower where you have a flower you hybrid it with another flower and one flower can adopt certain characteristics of that other flower and then we could also have recessive genes so you may not be aware that your flower has certain hidden genes inside of it or that the other flower that you're mating breeding your flower with has recessive genes too so there's elements of surprise buried in it um and at the time, there's a lot of comparisons being made about tulip mania, this speculative bubble in Holland in the 17th century, right. because of this kind of spike in prices that was happening in 2021. So I started reading several books on the subject, and the more I read, the more interesting the parallels and the differences became. And all of those ideas started to merge into this project, which we're soon to launch, called Heterosis. Um, if you don't mind, I'll say a couple of things about the, the tulip mania sure. phenomenon is so fascinating, was that this the as soon as you get the market involved with art and ideas of beauty, something happens to our idea of what beauty is. And it seemed back then in the 17th century, something a flower considered beautiful. Everybody wanted it until they bred it so much that there was like a a glut, you know, they were they were prevalent. 
the flowers. And then people decided that another more rarer flower was more beautiful and everybody shifted onto that flower. And then collectors started to, if they got a beautiful flower, they would keep all the offsets, the bulbs to themselves so they could control that market. So beauty is determined by rarity and value is dependent on rarity. So the, the, how those three things interrelate very interesting for an artist and how the market moves and and um and governs the way that our our tastes and uh, seem to be um you know very very interesting um the crash that happened in 1637 didn't do that much damage financially i think most of the people who were collecting and so did the big speculators they were wealthy merchants. They had enough money to lose. They weren't jumping into the canals, committing suicide. You know, they were okay. They survived. But there was a very damaging consequence, which was that the whole of that community, it was a community of information. Everybody was sharing all what was going on. It was like commerce and art and the, so- and the social sciences. They met up and they discussed all the developments that were going on. They collected paintings and shells and, and snake skins. Flowers were another part of that aesthetic. And there's a great bond of trust between all of these people. It's a very forward-thinking society. But because tulips, flowers generally are seasonal, when people had agreed to make a transaction for quite a high price, when that price dropped, when the crash came, and the flowers turned the earth, they weren't obliged to pay for that flower that they'd agreed to buy until the flower came through the earth and blossomed. So a lot of people decided they wanted to kind of renege on that rather high price they'd agreed to, and they didn't pay. And suddenly there was a breakdown in trust between this community, like something that was very solid, it was fractured, and that was a very significant uh, repercussion of this, this spike in prices in the early 17th century. And what I understood from the NFT sphere is how important communities are. It's all about building a community and keeping them engaged and talking to them and and just making them part of the project. And so I thought, okay, well, this is the solution to the problem that they had back then, that you can guarantee ownership of ephemeral assets, which I think is a very good uh, example of. It's not really a tangible thing, you know. It, it's it's it, it's only flowers for a couple of weeks every year, and you don't really know how it's going to flower next season. Right. So then I thought we could start making something about the whole community thing as well, and how important that is to my project. And the idea of making it this total project, so these flowers are involved. You buy one flower, it's in your wallet. You can hybrid it with another flower, and you try to get a flower that's more beautiful or more rare, etc. And then there's also this centralized space called the greenhouse, which is this recreation of London's National Gallery, as it may look if it was neglected and abandoned and overgrown with organic matter. And inside this virtual environment, all all of the flowers that we have in our collection will be growing and they'll be in their latest iteration every time you log in. And this is like a social, immersive, interactive, persistent world. So you can meet people in there, adopt an avatar, talk to other people, see a flower, see its value on OpenSea, et cetera. And the collectors become partners and collaborators in this kind of game and the mechanics that we've we've employed. And that, for me, is like a very mysterious thing in the same way that back in 17th century Holland, people were changing the evolution of flowers by choosing to breed one flower with another flower. They were kind of distorting the way that natural selection generally works and so in this case there's this weird mystery that people are going to be combining these various elements and i don't know what's going to come up we've set certain parameters but there's going to be a lot of surprises in there and that this that organic nature of the project really interests me you know my understanding is that some of these attributes will will pop up according to uh, what's in your wallet other attributes are going to be tied to uh, your breeding partner but, you know, in the end, do we know what all the possibilities are or are, are some of them kind of mysteries to even you and Daniil? Absolutely, yeah, um, which is the way we like it, I think. We wouldn't have built it if we weren't going to introduce an element of mystery and the unknown in there. There are things that we've employed, such as there are species that are not immediately available. And after a certain pattern of hybridization, collectors will, can unlock these new species, which are not in the in the first uh, 
set of the collection. And then we also have a lot of properties that are not strictly botanical, uh, although we've tried to make everything kind of as realistic as possible and to to look like flowers from the real world. There are certain traits, such as like a ghost flower, a transparent flower, or an ultraviolet flower, or a flower that has an animal skin pan to it. So there are other kind of special shaders that we've we've used in it. But the point is that we don't really know where it's going, and it's really kind of and it, there are infinite possibilities. When we can view the whole collection uh, as a whole in this kind of 3D space that is kind of a simulation of uh, of a post societal uh, rundown national gallery. Are, is that, are we are we to read anything into the the fact that you you have chosen a you know a societal landmark for the UK and are imagining what it, that's going to look like? Um, I wouldn't say post apocalyptic, but yeah, um, I can't say that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So are are we to read anything into that in terms of your your own anxiety about uh, about your country or? I think, I mean, I wanted something that resonated with me and the idea of all these beautiful, I go to the National Gallery quite a lot, and to have these revered paintings unseen by the human eye would be such a cruel twist of fate to have these great Caravaggio paintings that nobody can look at because the human race has departed from certainly this area. I mean, that's kind of quite a, a shocking prospect. We went through several ideas of what this centralized greenhouse space would look like but one of the predominant factors for me was always like that it should be dystopian and that nature should be fighting back and that it shows mankind's hubris in some way that we build these monuments to our intelligence but that nature will always usurp it and that the virility of nature is something to be reckoned with this is something i wanted to introduce and when I thought the National Gallery as being the venue to, to host all of our flowers in, it seemed interesting because then we have this juxtaposition of the cream of European painting from five, four hundred years ago against these new digital artifacts. And it's like, OK, so we've got oil on canvas and these big ornate gilt frames and we've got digital collectibles. And there's like a kind of a, a, a face-off between these two different mediums. Is digital media going to take over? Is oil on canvas an anachronistic tradition that's you know not really going to continue uh, and, and hold the uh, the attention that it that it once did? So that's a deliberate thing, and also to have flowers contrasted with old master paintings at the time of the tulip mania crash some of the tulips the flowers were more expensive than paintings of that same tulip because you could breed a flower and you could get other offsets and therefore it could multiply and it was alive and it was also prehistoric and it was also potentially god's creation so surely this was superior to a, a painting created by a great painting from holland at that period and this, which is more valuable nature or art and so we have the flowers contrasted with the oil paintings. And we have the oil paintings contrasted with digital collectibles and this new digital world that we're moving into. When is the NFT drop? I, I know if I go to OG Art, it uh, it says that I can go ahead and get on the wait list. Do you know what date the the actual drop is going to be taking place? It's still in play, Craig. Uh, so I'm afraid I can't give you an exact date because we don't know. But we're thinking early March at the moment. Yeah, so we're still like we're getting pretty close now. Everything's pretty much in place, so we're nearly there. Yeah, it looks like all of the details are at OG Art, and so we can uh, direct interested parties in in that direction. I know when I spoke to you the other day, you were uh, you had just returned from Paris, and it sounds like you're on your way to Hong Kong. <laughs> What's on the horizon for for you, Matt? Beyond uh, beyond this NFT drop. Okay, yeah. So I go to. I was in Paris, and I'm going to Hong Kong for a concert where I'll be showing a film that I've created for live performance of Foire's Requiem. Wow! So we're working with Insular Orchestra in Paris, and then they go to Hong Kong. It's like a large eighty piece orchestra, sixty piece choir, and then we show my film, and we kind of mix it live so that we're same tempo as the conductor 
very powerful thing to see. You know, you, not often as an artist you get the opportunity right. to have a full orchestra as a soundtrack to your artwork. So that's next, and then that we're going to a couple of other cities to Hobart in Tasmania, Malmo in Sweden, and then Christiansen in Norway. And then I'm showing uh, in London in mid-April uh, with an exhibition of some new works that I'm making. I have a an artwork, a robotic artwork, which is controlled by a social media feed. Oh, wow. And it basically analyzes incoming posts and determines how intense the abuse of those quotes were and then uh, instructs the robotic work to suffer the consequences of this incoming abuse on on social media there's that and several other works we kind of reflect on this quite malignant relationship to each other to the world that we have which is exacerbated by certain uh traits of social media it uh, it reminds me of one of my favorite black mirror episodes where uh, <laughs> the um r- robotic bees wound up um, yeah. re- responding to uh, the the evil social media posts that, and so that's um, I, I can't I, I I love I love your work and uh, I love you know how it's challenging and thought provoking and and really trying to get to the core of of some of the things that media really doesn't encourage us to to really be still and consider and think deeply about. I don't want to sound like a bit of a downer here. My problem is that I love images, totally in love with images. And I also love digital technology and technology generally. And my problem is that I know sometimes when I'm looking at images that I'm being manipulated. Right. And that makes me a little uncomfortable. And particularly with digital media, I know that I'm being manipulated somewhere by the software or something in there, some mechanism that somebody's designed. And it's that... Um, the appalling realization that I'm a victim of this thing, but I kind of like it and I'm addicted to it. And I'm, I can't keep myself away from it. So the artwork is a, is a way to kind of try to unpick that in some way, but not to do it in a, in a very dry, cold and disinterested way because I'm engaged and because I, I'm heavily involved in it myself, but I want to, want to do something about it. Right. So that this whole notion of uh, understanding that you're you're sitting down to, to view something uh, as a means of getting a fix instead of uh, instead of allowing yourself to just unwittingly um, become tethered to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Correct. Right. Yeah. That's all we can do. Right. Well, again, Matt, I, I really appreciate your time. And um, for for more information, folks can go to OG.art. Hopefully the drop goes uh, spectacularly. And um, again, safe travel, sir. Thank you very much. I'd just like to say a big thank you to Daniel Krivarushka, who designed all the flowers. An amazing job. Really persistent and patient with everybody getting them done. And Vlad and Nadia and Antoine and everybody there's involved with OG in this project. It's been a long haul and uh, looking forward to releasing soon. But thank you very much, Craig. It's been really interesting talking to you. Absolutely. Thank you. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.